I don't want to found an educational house. I want to bother the whole world. <laughs> I told God we want a million sisters before I die and 20 million after I die. <laughs> We're starting small, but so did Jesus. John Henry Weston, I thought, I read it somewhere that John the Baptist had been beheaded. <laughs> On my way to Christianity, some of you know from a Jewish background, oy vey, I tell people the most Jewish a Jew could be is to be Catholic, because that's true, right? Right. <laughs> On my way to Christianity, I read a little book called Hope for the Flowers. Hope for the Flowers, anybody read Hope for the Flowers? I thought it was Christian, I found out later it was Catholic, because I was taught Catholics weren't Christians, so there. So now I'm in the full measure of um, uh, Judaism and the full measure of Christianity. I've got it all. I've got it all. And I'm, I tell you what, I've told Sister Gertrude Marie and anyone that in this time, and we've heard this morning so much, I, I don't know about you, but I am the richest person on the face of the earth. We are, aren't we? We are here. We have... People say to me, well, why don't the Jews believe? Why doesn't this one believe? I don't know why they don't believe. I don't know why I do. That's the issue. Why has God poured his love on us? Why do we believe? Why do we have the truth? Why do we love the truth? Well, other Catholics have it. Why don't they live their faith? I don't know. Why do I? I don't know. But to whom much is given, much is required, and I want much to be required. We are the richest people on the face of the earth, and we have what every single soul on the face of the earth needs. And John Henry, it is not just hate to not tell LGBTQ, RSTV, whatever those initials are, <laughs> but not to tell anyone. Not to tell anyone. I remember a missionary um, who went to China and uh, was said to be the first missionary in China and told them about Christ, and they believed. And one man looked at him and said, how long have you known this? <laughs> what took you so long? That little book I read, Hope for the Flowers, I have to tell you two hours worth in a half hour, so I talk fast. Um, it's, it's a story about two caterpillars who fall in love. One is named yellow, that's the female, and the male is stripe, black and white stripe. And they fall in love, they get married, they live under, uh, male and female, and they get married, and they live under a leaf, and they set up their home, and they're really, really happy. But in time, stripe, the husband gets really restless. And he says, there's got to be more to life, there's got to be more than life. So he leaves little yellow, his wife, and he goes off to find meaning beyond what they have. And he looks all over, and, what, and then he comes across a, a pillar. It's a pillar of caterpillars. It's a caterpillar pillar. And it goes way up into the clouds. And thousands of caterpillars are climbing up because the answer's up there. So he says, OK, I'm going to find the answer. So he climbs up. And just before he gets to the clouds, he sees the caterpillars falling through the clouds down and they're trying to shout, there's nothing up there, it's just the top and you fall over. There's nothing up there. And he gets the message and he says, well then I'm not going. And so now he has to wake, make his way back down to the ground, stepping on everybody to get back down. He goes on, he comes across a field of trees and he sees um, these caterpillars going up into what looks like well, they're cocoons, but he doesn't know what they are. And they go and spin this thing around them, and it's very dark. And he watches this. And they come out in time, butterflies. Now, you know the story of, uh, what's the word, uh, metamorphosis, metamorphosis or something like that. You go in, and a caterpillar has to die. The whole thing decomposes to come out a butterfly. It's what Jesus said, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and die, it stays, stays alone. 
these caterpillars go in there. They don't know. It's completely unknown. They don't know they'll come out a butterfly. They don't know that they'll breathe. All they're going to do is die. They go in to die, and they come out a new creation. And the scriptures say if anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation. All things pass away. All things become new. Well, little Sprite, black and white caterpillar, did this. He went in. Oy, he had the nerve, and he went in, and he came out a gorgeous black and white butterfly, and he went to find Yellow, who he loves, his wife, but she's another creature now. So he finds her, and this time she's looking for Stripe. So she's come across this caterpillar pillar, and she's thinking of climbing it. And this gorgeous black and white butterfly that she cannot communicate with, they're in two different worlds, he comes up to her, this little yellow caterpillar, and he can't speak to her, but somehow she looks at him and his eyes penetrate her with such love she could hardly bear it. And as she's going toward this pillar, and she doesn't know who he is, she's going toward the pillar, but the butterfly keeps coming and flying away, so she should follow him. She finally gets the message, and she follows him, and he keeps leading her up. She goes into the cocoon, comes out a yellow butterfly, they live happily ever after. That's a very, very fast story. We have to die. I'm thinking, there's so little time to give, you could have spoken for five days. What? So I thought, what is it? What is it I, that from my heart I want to tell you? I want to tell you to die. I want to tell you to die. Paul says, I die daily. I want to tell you to die. Now the little caterpillar went to die for what they didn't know. I want to read you a story of people that went to die for what they did know. And it's in the Old Testament. Am I talking too fast? Are you okay? Okay. Um, it's a story of the books of First and Second Maccabees in the Old Testament. Oh, how do I do this quick? Less than 200 years before Christ, there was a man named Antiochus Epiphanes who became the leader of the Greeks. All right. And he decided to impose on the Jewish people their pagan systems, their pagan food, their pagan customs, and these were very faithful Jews. And so he attacked them to not live the faith, to impose on them if they wanted to live, to do what they did, to eat what they ate, to not worship the true God under the covenant of Moses. And it wasn't only the Greeks that bothered these Jewish people, but it was the Hellenized Jew. Hellenized Jew is a Greek Jew. He spoke Greek instead of Hebrew, but he took on the customs of the Greeks, their culture, their pagan customs. In other words, he was in the world and of it, not in the world and not of it. So these Jews, under a man named Mattathias, rose up against all the Greeks. Mattathias had three sons, and the leader of the three sons was Jewish. Uh, Jewish, ah, they were all Jewish. Um, Judas Maccabeus. Um, they were the Maccabees. And um, I, I, I can't read the whole thing to you. I do want to read the whole thing. Okay. Um, so the books are about the uprising, and I'm going to tell you before I read it the message. The message of the story is that for the just man, now the Jews were terribly persecuted and many put to death, but the message is for the just man who were the Maccabees, their supreme glory consists in being ready to give one's life, if necessary, to defend God's interest, to defend his law, which every Jew then among them, um, if he wanted to obey and be part of the people of God, he had to obey strictly, not some things, no cafeteria stuff, but everything, and strictly. And so I'm going to read one account of this martyrdom. It's a mother and her seven sons, and I tell you, I'm going to read very fast. I'm not going to stop the comment. I want to, but I'm not going to do it. I have control. <laughs> um, to me, it's probably the most inspiring, encouraging story in all of history. It happened. Okay, hold on, one second. 
I have to do something here. I have to get a little extra light. Don't get old. <laughs> there. It happened also that seven brothers and their mothers, right in the middle of the persecutions, and an elderly man, Eleazar, had just been put to death. And people said, Eleazar, you're a leader. Don't be put to death. Pretend you're eating their food. You don't have to. Just pretend. And he said, what am I going to pretend I'm giving in? I, I'm going to betray Pretend I'm betraying God and the people? What's that going to do to the young people? Uh, no, he didn't. And he, and he uh, rather that his life be taken so that he could live with God forever. And by the way, this book right here speaks about the resurrection. They believed in the resurrection. Otherwise, why be ready to give our lives? We not only believe, as John Henry told us, in the, that Our Lady's heart will triumph, we believe in the, in the resurrection. Otherwise, it's not worth anything, right? Say right, right, okay. <laughs> so this, it happened also that seven brothers and their mother were arrested. I'm gonna read you, if you haven't read this, it's because you're Catholic. <laughs> I was a Protestant for 18 years trying to save Catholics. And, so, and I read the Bible every year. Every year I read through the Bible. And people say to me, well, you're Catholic now. Do you still read the Bible? I said, no. Why should I read the Bible? I'm Catholic. I don't have to read it anymore. OK. It happened also that seven brothers and their mother were arrested and were being compelled by the king under torture with whips and cords to partake of unlawful swine's flesh. You know what a swine, that word that begins with P? It's not Jewish. Pig. All right. One of them, acting as their spokesman, said, what do you intend to ask and learn from us? For we are ready to die rather than transgress the laws of our fathers. The king fell into a rage and gave orders that pans and cauldrons be heated. These were heated immediately, and he commanded that the tongue of their spokesman be cut out. Now, this is some gross thing, so man up or woman up. and that they scalp him and cut off his hands and feet while the rest of the brothers and the mother looked on. When he was utterly helpless, the king ordered them to take him to the fire, still breathing, and to fry him in a pan. The smoke from the pan spread wildly, but the brothers and their mother encouraged one another to die nobly, saying, the Lord God is watching over us, and in truth, has compassion on us, as Moses declared in his song, which bore witness against the people to their faces when he said, and he will have compassion on his servants. After the first brother had died, I'm not going to spare you, I'm reading all these seven. After the first brother had died in this way, they brought forward the second for their sport. They tore off the skin of his head with the hair and asked him, will you eat rather than have your body punished limb by limb? He replied, to um, the language, in the language of his fathers, which was Hebrew, and he said no. Therefore he in turn underwent tortures, as the first brother had done. And when he was at his last breath, he said, this is the dying son of the mother, you accursed wretch, you dismiss us from this present life, but the king of the universe will raise us up to an everlasting renewal of life because we have died for his laws. After him, the third was victim of their sport. When it was demanded, he quickly put out his tongue and courageously stretched forth his hands and said nobly, I got these from heaven, and because of his laws, I disdain them. Detest, how's that? Pray to disdain your hands. Detest, no. We should be attached to nothing but God. And from him, I hope to get them back again. You see the resurrection, all our parts are going to be fine. As a result, the king himself and those with him were astonished at the young man's spirit, for he regarded his sufferings as nothing. And when he too had died, they maltreated and tortured the fourth in the same way. And he, when he was near death, he said, one can, but cannot but choose to die at the hands of men and to cherish the hope that God gives of being raised again by him. But for you, there will be no resurrection to life. 
Next, they brought forward the fifth and maltreated him. But he looked at the king and said, because you have authority among men, mortal though that you are, you do what you please, but do not think that God has forgotten our pe forsaken our people. Keep on and see how his mighty power will torture you and your descendants. After him, they brought forward the sixth, and when he was about to die, he said, do not deceive yourself in vain, for we are suffering these things on our own account because of our sins against our own God. Which one of us will say that? We are suffering all these things because of our own sins against our own God. God sees us as a people. We could say, well, I didn't, what did I do? Well, as a people, as a people, born from the first Adam, reborn from the second. We are his people. And it's because our sins, whom God loves, he chases. Um, therefore, astounding things have happened, but do not think that you will go unpunished for having tried to fight against God. The mother was especially admirable and worthy of honorable memory. Though she saw her seven sons perish within a single day, I get calls from mothers who say, uh, my, my son wants to marry an atheist and all that, and I don't want to not go to the wedding because I don't want we should be separated. And oh my goodness, listen to this mother. Though she saw her seven sons perish within a single day, she bore it with good courage. Because of her hope in the Lord, she encouraged each of them in the language of their fathers, filled with a noble spirit. She fired her woman's reasoning with a man's courage and said to them, uh, now listen to this, a mother's message to her son, her sons. I do not know how you came into being in my womb. It was not I who gave you life and breath nor I who set in order the elements within each of you. Therefore, the creator of the world, who shaped the beginning of man and devised the origin of all things, will in his mercy give life and breath back to you again, since you now forget yourself, yourselves for the sake of his laws. Antiochus, the evil ruler, felt that he was being treated with contempt and he was suspicious of her, reproachful tone. The youngest brother being still alive, Antiochus not only appealed to him in words, but promised with oaths that he would make him rich and enviable if he would turn from the ways of his fathers and that he would take him as his friend and entrust him with public affairs. Since the young man would not listen to him at all, the king called the mother to him and urged her to advise the youth to save himself. After much urging on his part, she undertook to persuade her son. But leaning close to him, she spoke in their native tongue as follows, deriding the cruel tyrant. My son, have pity on me. I carried you nine months in my womb and nursed you for three years and have reared you and brought you up to this point in your life and have taken care of you. I beseech you, my child, to look at the heaven and the earth and see everything that is in them and recognize that God did not make them out of things that existed. Thus also mankind came into being. Do not fear this butcher, she said to her son. Do not fear this butcher but prove worthy of your brothers, accept death, so that in God's mercy, I may get you back again with your brothers. And of course, that's in the resurrection. That's a mother. That's a mother who fulfills her calling of getting her children to heaven. And while she was still speaking, this young man said, what are you waiting for? I will not obey the king's command. This is the youngest boy. 
But I obey the command of the law that was given to our fathers through Moses. But you, who have contrived all sorts of evil against the Hebrews, will certainly not escape the hands of God, for we are suffering because of our own sins. No self-pity here. And if our living Lord is angry for a little while to rebuke and discipline us, he will again be reconciled. He will again be reconciled with his own servants. But you, unholy wretch, you most defiled of all men, do not be elated in vain and puffed up by uncertain hopes when you raise your hand against the children of heaven. You have not yet escaped the judgment of the Almighty, all-seeing God. Apply everything to what we've been talking about today. Everything. This is not hate. This is love. Love speaks the truth. For our brothers, after enduring a brief suffering, have drunk of ever-flowing life under God's covenant. But you, by the judgment of God, will receive just punishment for your arrogance. I, like my brothers, give up body and life for the laws of our fathers, appealing to God to show mercy soon to our nation. And by afflictions and plagues, you see, that's how God shows mercy, by afflictions and plagues to make you confess that he alone is God. If there's a God, if he's a loving God, what's he sending us all these trials? Because he loves you. And he wants you should be with him for all eternity. Because he doesn't hate you. Because he loves you. And he'll stop at nothing to get you to bring you to heaven. He stopped us at nothing to go on the cross for us. Through me and my brothers, he, he sent all these afflictions and plagues to make you confess that he alone is God, and through me and my brothers to bring to an end the wrath of the Almighty, which has justified, which has justly fallen on our whole nation. See, it's for their salvation. The king fell into a rage and handed him worse, handled him worse than the others being exasperated at his scorn. So he died in his integrity, putting his whole trust in the Lord. Last of all, the mother died after her sons. None of them took credit for their victory, none of the Jews because they knew it was God's victory. They knew it was God's victory, and Christian tradition venerates these seven brothers, and there are several shrines in several countries set up to them. Now, can you imagine those seven sons would have died for God had they not lived for him? No. No. Can you imagine that their mother, a woman of such deep faith, Allowing, can you imagine that woman allowing the pagan world to raise her sons? Even the Hellenistic Jews, who were indeed Jews, but had bought in to the culture of the time. Can you imagine her allowing the world to instill in them the values of their family and people? She would have forfeited her call from God. And every mother who allows that, who allows society to raise their children, even in the name of a Catholic school, is forfeiting her call and damning her children. Yeah, unless that Catholic school is really Catholic. You see, children leave the Catholic faith. They think they've left the Catholic faith, but they never knew what it was because it had the name Catholic necessarily. Is the world any less pagan today? It's not. Should the corrupt ways of our fallen world dictate the morals by which Catholic parents are called to raise their children? Should pagan society in which we live today determine our food, our dress, our dignity, our speech, our morals, our success? Should it determine the education we provide for our children? In Casti Canubi, Pope Pius XI said this, the blessing of offspring is not completed by the mere beginning of children, but something else must be added. 
namely the proper education of offspring. For the most wise God would have failed to make sufficient provision for children that had been born, and so for the whole human race, if he had not given to those to whom he had entrusted the power and right to beget them, the power and the right to educate them. Beloved, 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 beloved. When parents stand before God, it is not the schools or the church that will be accountable for them. It is the parents. It is the parents that have been given the stewardship. And if we send children to a public school, sometimes that's better than a Catholic school. At least they know they're not getting Catholic education. Or to a Catholic school or homeschool, whatever it is. We must know what they've learned and absorbed before they go to bed at night. No parent can say, although many do, but no more. Oh, well, I didn't know what the, my child was being taught. I didn't know they had sex ed. I didn't know they were talking about gender ideology. I didn't know that. What do you mean you don't know? It's your child. God gave you that child to raise for him. How could you, no parent can let their child, ugh, enough. No one, I'm still quoting Pope Pius XI, no one can fail to see that children are incapable of providing wholly for themselves, even in matters pertaining to their natural life, and much less in those pertaining to the supernatural, but we require for many years to be helped, instructed, and educated by others. Now, still Pope Pius. It is certain that both by the law of nature and of God, this right and duty of educating offspring belongs in the first place to those who began the work of nature by giving them birth, and they are indeed forbidden to leave unfinished this work and so expose it to certain ruin. Forbidden. Not a good idea to teach your children the faith. Parents are forbidden not to for the propagation and education of children. That is what marriage is for. But in matrimony, provision has been made in the best possible way for this education of children that is so necessary. For since the parents are bound together by an indissoluble bond, the care and mutual help of each is always at hand. One more paragraph from Pius the 11th. Even the very best instruction given by the church, however, will not alone suffice to bring about once more conform to bring about conformity of marriage to the law of God. Something more is needed in addition to the education of the mind, namely a steadfast, now this is important, it's not just knowledge. Education is the entire person who Maccabees didn't say a thing about what these children knew, except they knew the law of God. But they were formed, godly young men. That's what education is. Number one, don't worry. Mother said, I can't homeschool my children. I can't do it. I know science and math. I didn't even graduate high school. That, don't worry about that. They need you. They need to be formed in virtue, in wholeness. Anybody could open a book and read it. Good materials out there. In addition to the education of the mind, they need a steadfast determination of the will on the part of husband and wife, husband and wife, both, to observe the sacred laws of God and of nature in regard to marriage. In fine, in spite of what others may wish to assert and spread abroad by word of mouth or in writing, let husband and wife resolve to stand fast to the commandments of God in all things that matrimony demands. Always render to each other the assistance of mutual love to preserve the honor of chastity. Chastity not only outside of marriage, but within marriage, as is an impossibility. It's almost time. I'm not on the second page. This is terrible. What am I gonna do? Anthony, you stay back there. Don't you <laughs> stay there. Oh, boy. 
You know, I, I can't read it. I, there's so much. I, I don't know what I was thinking. I shouldn't have read Maccabees. <laughs> Ephesians, wives, submit to your husbands. Husbands, lay down your life. A wife is to submit to a man, to the love of a man who will lay down his life for her. The man is the head. The woman is the heart. Pope Leo XIII said the man is the ruler of the family and the head of the woman, but because she is flesh of his flesh, bone of his bone, let her be subject and obedient to the man, not as a servant, but as a companion, so that nothing be lacking of honor or of all things outside of God in conformity to the divine will and pleasure. Let him, no matter how hard, has been his battle with the world in amassing, this is the father, no matter how hard has been his battle with the world in amassing wealth or securing comfort and independence, never allow his children to believe that his heart is set on what he possesses. You see, no matter what you teach your children, John Henry made the point, nothing will teach them more than your example ever will. John Henry never gave his father that speech. He knew the answer because of his father's life, even though he went astray. Okay, I'm skipping everything. I'm just skipping everything, but I have to do something here. Um, all right. I wanted to tell them how to be chased. I'm gonna do that. Yeah, okay. Get ten? Ten? Yeah. Yahoo! <laughs> okay. He's scaring me. Okay. All right. So, oh, there's just so much here, and, uh, but it's okay. I won't go back. I'll go on. I'm just skipping so much. We'll meet after, and I'll give you the whole talk. Okay. Parents need to teach chastity is lifelong. It doesn't have to do with singleness. It has to do with being faithful to your state in life. If you're married, you must be chaste, All right? Marriage doesn't give you license to abuse one another. You must be chaste in your marital relations. You need to be chaste if you're single. You need to be chaste if you're religious. And chaste is the interior. I'm going to read it from John Lacken's talk, his paper on modesty. John Lacken said, modesty is primarily not an exterior quality, but that modesty begins interiorly in the depths of a female heart that longs to please God. Okay? Now, I've got everything about a woman's function, a man's function. What was I thinking? I don't know. But modesty has to do, chastity has to do with um, behavior, speech, dress, everything. Behavior, if you're a woman, you never put your hands on a man, single or married. You never say, good job. You never do that. Keep your hands to yourself. It's not a friendly gesture. Keep your hands to yourself. Men, keep your hands to yourself. Don't you ever tell a woman, if you're dating, young men, don't tell her you love her until you're ready to marry her. If you're not ready to propose, keep it to yourself. Be honest. Be men. Speech, let your speech be seasoned with grace. Um, no gossip. It, it kills. Dress. Women, if you want to know what to wear when you look in the mirror, young ladies, I want to tell young women how to dress. What they're wearing today used to be my underwear. <laughs> okay, you don't have tomatoes to throw. I'm just going to say this very quick so I can say a couple of other things in five minutes. I'm just going to say it, and if you're wearing it now, just don't, don't worry. Just don't ever wear it again. So, women, ah, shouldn't be in pants. That's all. Forget that I said it. Don't, no pants. Think the Blessed Mother in pants. Whether they're tight or loose, you're, you're, you're looking at a woman's body. You don't want that. You don't want anything sleeveless. I know, I know, I've seen a lot of you and you're all gorgeous. Nothing sleeveless. Nothing low cut. Um, nothing tight, nothing that you could see through. Even if it's a slip that you see through your blouse, you see the slip. Nobody should see your slip. Uh, what else? Uh, length of skirts, mid-calf, nothing shorter. 
Think of the Blessed Mother. My rule is when in doubt, don't. Think of the Blessed Mother when you want to get dressed. I, I tell young people, so, I want to tell them, I want to tell the mothers, don't let your daughters dress that way, but the mothers are dressed that way. What are you going to do? Be lovely, 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 lovely women. Read John Lacken's article on modesty and how a young lady that he, he didn't even need to persuade her. She was affected by the example of his own children in their home. And she felt like a woman for the first time putting on, she didn't even own a dress. It's wonderful. Men, nobody wants to sit next to you in church when you have shorts on and thongs and bare legs during mass. Be respectful. Be respectful. OK. Here, Pope Pius XII, Christian mothers and fathers, I add. If only you knew the future of distress and peril, of shame ill-restrained, that you prepare for your sons and daughters in imprudently accustoming them to live hardly clothed and in making them lose the sense of modesty. You should be ashamed of yourself, Pius XII, and of the harm done to the little ones whom heaven entrusted to your care to be reared in Christian dignity and culture. Okay. <sighs> Oh, this, okay. I'm gonna, I'm putting it all away. I'm gonna tell you one story, one parable, and a closing scripture, and we're done. Okay. Um, it's, it's, it's a story that I read years ago. It's called The Lily in a Pond. Maybe some of you know it. There's a particular lily that when you put it in a pond, it naturally doubles in size each day. You put on your math cap. It naturally doubles in size each day. OK, so here's the pond. I put a little lily in it, and the lily doubles in size each day. So it grows uh, exponentially by multiplication, not addition. So here's half the pond. If it takes the lily 29 days to cover half the pond, in how many days will the lily cover the entire pond? I haven't heard the answer yet. Maybe somebody said, who said one? You got it. It took 29 days to cover half the pond, but it doubles in size every day, doubles in size. One more day, it'll cover the whole pond. I'm using that analogy because I think we are maybe, I'm not a prophet, but I think maybe we're at day 28. if not 29. There's no more time. There's no more time. Don't say my children are 65 already and I can't change them. Go to them. Beg them. Go on your knees saying, I was wrong. I was wrong to dress, let you dress half naked. I was wrong to this, to that, to that. Your dad and I, your mom and I, we were wrong. We found out what's right. We beg you to listen to us. What you do is between you and God, but we beg you to listen. If you know someone and you haven't told them about Christ and his church, yeah, but they're Protestant, so what? But they'll throw all the scripture at you, so what? Yeah, but I don't know the scripture, so what? You say to them, the only reason you memorize that scripture is because the Catholic Church gave it to you. Don't worry about what you do, don't have. God holds us accountable for what we do have. And we have all that is needed for anyone's salvation, and we have no more time. We have no more time, beloved. We are the Maccabees of today. We are God's Maccabees. And we need to live for him if we're ever going to die for him. I read you one closing passage, and it's from the Apostle Paul to the Ephesians. And it's my prayer for you. For this reason, he says, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, 
and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God, and he ends now to him, who by the power at work within us is able to do far more abundantly than all we could ask or even think. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. God bless you.